homily for Christmas. There's a story told about a schoolboy in a nativity play who had set his heart on being Joseph, but alas, he was just assigned as the innkeeper. And instead of slamming the door shut um, behind the retreating figures of Mary and Joseph, he runs after them and shouts, Come back! Come back! Please, come back! You can have my room. Now, I think that's the spirit of Christmas. Adults pretend, of course, that Christmas is only for children, an engaging deception. Christmas is surely for those who need to recover hope to find a savior. A child still believes in salvation. Each of us needs a savior, but for many, the world may come across as a very forsaken place. If God now has died on us, the world is a wintry place. But we recover a sense of hope again in the eyes of a child. It's very, very painful to live without hope. Many people in public life make promises, but of course they always fail to deliver. Some conclude that they must walk alone, not sure where they're going. Others, however, persist in believing in better things. Christmas reassures them of this, and their hope remains steadfast. Berries grow in winter. Christmas celebrates the birth of the newborn, which is full of mystery and promise. It is a mystery of the dawn, flush with possibilities. The sad at heart can find in the newborn a rebirth of lost innocence. A dead candle is kindled, rekindled. Because the baby is weak and defenseless, we can identify with its condition because I believe there's a crying child within all of us. There is an ache in us which only God can satisfy. The child is strong with promise and the magic of a new personality. Grown-ups, saddened by too many sorrows, fall silent in the presence of the newborn, but something stirs. It is the dawn of new hope, without which life has indeed very little meaning. All hope converges on someone, someone who will save us from past follies and indeed present fears. That someone is the newborn, God made man, whose coming into the world we celebrate at Christmas. God promised a saviour and the world was on the lookout for a kind of a superstar or a superhero. But he sent his son, a child of weakness and of winter. At the crib, the image of God as dread finally dies. We see God as he is, not over us, but with us, not against us, but for us. A very happy Christmas to you all. Homily for the Feast of the Holy Family. Now, there was a study conducted over a seven-year period at the University of Virginia found that one year after their divorce, 60% of men and 73% of women felt they had made a mistake by splitting up. Even those who were miserable in their marriages said that if they had tried harder, they might have been able to work out their marital problems and indeed stay together. Now, soon after celebrating the birth of Jesus, it is only fitting that we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Family. Jesus needed 
the Son of God, Jesus, needed the warmth and security of a family to grow and develop as a person. It was very distressing news recently about little Arthur and Star. Parental breakup was part of the backdrop to which went heartbreakingly wrong. From today's reading, Mary and Joseph have pressures imposed on them from the beginning, from the outset. For a start, they seem to be constantly on the move. I discovered recently that it's actually a hundred miles, or roughly a hundred, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, for a woman with child, that would have been a very hazardous, precarious journey. And then, of course, when the baby was born, they had to make the long journey to Egypt. In this context, context we could spare a thought and a prayer for all those migrant families who are on the move as a result of war or famine or dire economic necessity. Today's reading says that Mary, Joseph and Jesus settled down in a town called Nazareth. Now families, especially children, need a settled environment in order to degrow and develop as persons. Too much chopping and changing does them no good. Herod was hell-bent on decimating the Holy Family. He symbolizes all those forces at work in our society which militate against family cohesion. Some years ago, Pope Benedict said, those who undermine the fundamental role of the family cause a deep wound to society which is impossible to repair. Of course, there are alternative family setups these days which are very far removed from our Christian understanding of marriage and the family as taught by the church from the big, very beginning and still teaches today. The Holy Father goes on. The family based on marriage, now that's not living together, between a man and a woman, and we must stress that as well, is a natural and irreplaceable institution and is fundamental towards the common good of every society. Having said that, there is no such thing as a flawless family, just as there, there is no such thing either as a perfect priesthood, as we all know very well. To a certain extent, because of sin, there are anomalies in every family. Families with faith, however, will be able to weather the storm when things go a bit awry for them. They will rely on the grace of God, which will help them pull together in good times and in bad. The Holy Family had their share of difficulties, but their faithfulness in carrying out the will of God was their prime concern. Let it be ours too. So, as the new year approaches, let us dedicate and consecrate our home life to the Lord through the intercession of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And may family solidarity be constantly renewed and upheld. Thank you all for listening, and God bless you all.